when you look at your results, they're strong. Are you very optimistic about the future? I'm very pleased, Francine, and thank you for having me with the strong results in the first half. I mean, I think that those results are a function of good revenue growth across the globe. All of our global businesses have strong revenue growth. All of the product lines within those businesses, strong revenue growth. But also all geographies contributed to that performance. Um, so I'm pleased with the outcome. It's a $21.7 billion PBT, which produces a reported royalty of 22.4%. But to be fair, I need to back out two notable items in Q1, uh, which boosted that return. But underlying then, excluding those, it's still a return on tangible equity of 18.5%. That's a very strong performance. Our confidence is high on the future, which is why we've changed our ROTI guidance going forward. We've increased it yep. uh, from the 12 plus guidance we had before to a guidance of mid-teens for 2023 and 2024. And I'm really pleased that we were able to, because of our strong capital generation, commit to a further 10 cents dividend, uh, interim dividend uh, for, for Q2 and an additional $2 billion, up to $2 billion buyback um, which we intend to complete in the next three months. So that's a good outcome. Um, but I do want to say it's broad-based across all geographies yep. and across all business lines. No, from the outside, it seems you're promoting and putting a lot of focus on your business in India. Within Asia, is there a slight pivot away from China to focus on India? No, we're, we're looking to invest in all of Asia. We see great opportunities still in China, here in Hong Kong. But also we've got we see opportunities within India and Singapore and Singapore, not just for Singapore alone, but Singapore and its gateway into ASEAN. So we're investing equally between all parts of Asia um, and we're seeing good, good performance um, across the whole of Asia. But also we're investing in new business lines for us. So I think in the past we've underinvested in our wealth business across Asia. We had a very good business here in Hong Kong. We invested in that. But we didn't invest enough in mainland China or in Singapore or in India. And we're correcting that now. And you can see the evidence of that in these results. You know, we in Asia, yeah. we took in $27 billion in net new invested assets on behalf of our clients. Um, and that, you know, if you look globally, we, in the last 12 months, we took in $75 billion in net new invested assets into our wealth business. That's a function of the investment program we started over two years ago. So, so how active are you in helping, for example, to finance still some of the Belt and Road projects? I mean, we look at all of those projects that are taking place, uh, all of the big infrastructure projects. We're very particular focused at the moment on infrastructure projects around sustainability, new hydrogen plants, new wind and solar, uh, ways to decarbonize. So we're working with our clients uh, across all of Asia, but globally. We've done some big transactions as well in the Middle East. Uh, where we're looking to help clients invest in the new technology to build uh, the new greener economy of the future. Uh, so we look at them on a project by project basis, um, and some of them are within uh, the Silk Road, the Belt and Road initiative, but some of them will be outside of that. Many of them will be outside. No, no. How, how worried are you about Chinese real estate? And actually, if you look at you know what you've announced today, developments could be worse than what you're expecting. And will you have to take more, you know, more fresh charges against some of your exposure there? No, I think we we what we announced today was we do a scenario on what a potential plausible downside could be on that. We're not predicting that. We scenario plan that. We did take some additional provisions in the in quarter two, but they were. They were relatively manageable within our overall ECL charge. I think we took about 300 million in the first half of this year. That was top up on some existing provisions. Uh, but if I look at my overall ECL charge for the first half of the year, it was 1.3 billion, and that absorbed commercial real estate in China. Specifically on real estate in China, it will be a challenge in six, 12 months. The industry still has some challenges ahead. We believe we're well provisioned. We're comfortable with the provisioning we have at the half year. And we'll have to wait and see how the policy measures continue to adopt, adapt. And what is really challenging in the real estate market in China is a lack of demand. And that's really where I think the solution to the challenges will come from. There's been a long silence, long, long silence from Ping Ang. Is it reasonable to assume that you've won the argument about HSBC's future? 
Well, listen, we continue to have dialogue with Pyongyang as we do with all institutional shareholders, and we have done since the AGM. But the AGM was conclusive. Um, it delivered a very conclusive outcome on the debate around restructuring. Um, we've moved on from that now. We're very much focused on performance. We also know that that's a, a big focus for Pyongyang, as it is for all institutional shareholders, all shareholders, including the retail shareholders here in Hong Kong. And I think the first six months' results a testament to our focus on that and the work we've done over the past three years. Strong revenue growth, tight cost discipline, good capital management, over $128 billion of unproductive RWAs taken out over the past three years. And we're very much focused on our core strengths. And the results today are evidence of that. An 18% return on tangible equity with good, strong capital generation going forward with the prospect of... Um, more dividend and more return coming from that performance. That's the important thing I'm focused on. But so what are you reading at the moment, that Ping An can come back and actually give, give you hassle on how they see the future of HSBC? Or if when you say you've moved on, have they also moved on from this argument? Well, that is a matter for, for Ping An, so it's not fair for me to comment on their behalf. But I think the AGM decision was very decisive and conclusive. The vote was very clear. And I believe that matter is now behind us. We are, ha are very, very much focused on performance. So that matter is now closed from the point of view of HSBC. What does the decision to downsize your London headquarters tell us about your commitment to the UK? We're absolutely committed to the UK. And our decision on premises in the UK is a function, frankly, of some of the reduction in costs that we've done over the past three to four years. It's a function of changing working patterns, and it's a function of some of the offshoring that we've done. So our, our need for premises in the UK is less today than it was three, four years ago. Um, so our choice on where we relocated the head office wasn't a decision between Canary Wharf and the city. It was a decision based on available premises somewhere around 20, 2026 and 2027 that had the capacity but not too much capacity to absorb the, head, the people we wanted. So, frankly, we needed a building half the size of Canary Wharf, and there aren't that many buildings that were available. This was not a decision between the city or Canary Wharf. It was a practical decision based on property availability. Given where we are now, worldwide, and some of, I guess, the, the influences across the world, do you say your reasons for remaining in the UK are actually decreasing? No, nope. I think UK is a very good place to have a headquarter for a global institution. It covers all the time zones well. It's a good environment to operate in with lots of professional services to support a, an organization. But you've got to remember, we're a global business. We have to have a headquarter somewhere, and the UK has been a good headquarter for us. But I'm also, at the moment, in our headquarters in Hong Kong. And in a few weeks' time, I'll be in our headquarters in the Middle East. So, you know, we're a global organization. Um, and there has to be a place that where you're registered, and the UK is a good place to be registered. It's a good environment to operate a global global bank with a good regulatory environment, um, and we're very happy there. So, when you look at UK mortgages, I think you were the first major bank to actually start cutting your rates last week. Do you see rates substantially falling for mortgages in the near future? I think it's going to be a function, frankly, of the swap rates in the UK. You know, it's not just the base rates in the UK, but it's the swap rates, because most mortgages are priced off swaps. And it will be there for a function of what is the market confidence? Where does the market see the yield curve? And we saw the yield curve go up, and then we started to see it come down. Our ambition is to try and make sure our rates are as um, reasonable as possible to help customers navigate what is definitely a challenging environment of higher rates in the market plus higher inflation. So if we can move down, we will do as quickly as possible. Um, so that was our decision. Um, it will, it will, I can't predict what the yield curve necessarily will do. There is the prospect of more interest rate rises uh, in the future in order to combat inflation. And that therefore could change the yield curve for the swap rates. Um, and therefore we may have to adjust pricing then, up or down. But do, do you see a correction in UK property prices going forward, a significant correction? I mean, the UK property market has been extremely resilient. Uh, the mortgage market in the UK, and I'll broaden that out to generally the business community in the UK, despite challenging conditions, 
They've been extremely resilient. Our mortgage book is holding up extremely well. Um, our corporate lending book is holding up extremely well. There are challenges. There are pressures starting to be evident, but they're relatively uh, manageable uh, from a UK economy point of view and a bank point of view. Um, but higher interest rates for longer will continue to pressure both consumers and businesses. And it's in all our interests that we can get inflation down as soon as possible in order to ease the pressure on the yield curve and rates. Uh, no, it's clear that in the last couple of weeks, Nigel Farage really dominated the headlines when it came to banking in the UK. Do you think it will change uh, banking in this country? And would you ever drop a customer because of their political beliefs? Well, first, our policy is very clear. We do not exit a client or debank a client based on their lawful personal views. We don't do that as part of our policy. Um, what I also want to do is say we will work with the authorities in the UK, uh, the FCA and the regulators in the UK in whatever work they're going to do over the next few weeks to try and find a good resolution uh, to the current situation that exists. But our policy is we do not debank based on the lawful personal views of our customers.